No More A River, a multimedia presentation with poetry, narration, visual art and music, building upon Tigor's celebration of human relationships and compassion across divides, geographical, political, cultural, and others. This is by Debaroti Chakraborty and Rosalie Purvis. I'm just going to give you a small note on both of them. Debaroti Chakraborty is an assistant professor in the Department of Performing Arts, Presidency University, India. As a researcher, artist, and performance thinker, she focuses on making cross-cultural and intercultural performances based on lived experiences, narratives, and oral history. Her doctoral work broadly studies narratives of women in India and Latin America through a comparative perspective in the context of borders. She has been touring, researching, and presenting performances in collaboration with artists, researchers, and communities in India, the US, Canada border, and the US Mexico border. She is the creative director of Chai Pani, a Kolkata based performing arts collective. She also writes as a performance critic with The Telegraph. Rosalie Purvis is the Libra Assistant Professor of Theatre and English at the University of Maine, USA. Rosalie has researched on cross cultural performance for her PhD from Cornell University. Since 2000, she has presented theater in New York City at the Atlantic Theater, Dixon Place, Estrogenius, Teatro Lateo, the Culture Project 59E59, Puerto Rico, Traveling Company, DNA and BATS, that's the sum total of all that she's associated with. Recently, she joined Kolkata-based arts collective Chai Pani, and together they perform at various national borders. She has taught at Jadapur University, Kolkata, and the City University of New York, among others. Over to Debarati Chakraborty and Rosalie Purvis. No more a river. My darling Dadima, today when after weeks I came back to Kabul, the post was waiting for me. Besides yours, I have received other letters from home. Moms, brothers, Uma Didis and Sushmitas. But the sweetest letter is yours, in which you threaten me with making me stand in a corner with my nose to the wall and boxing my ears as a punishment for not writing home for such a long time. All this scolding of yours makes me feel as if I've again become a little girl sitting in your lap, swinging to and fro in your rocking chair and telling me stories. Stories from your own childhood in this very lifetime about Rahmat, the hawker from Kabul. When you first saw him, you were frightened and thought that his bag was full of little children. <laughs> then he became friends. He would talk together, he would listen to you and figure out your becomes, raisins and walnuts. Once he told you that he had a huge elephant in his small bag. You told me that the day Rahmat Baba was released after eight years in prison was the day of your marriage. He borrowed dry fruits from another for her and gave it to you as your wedding gift. You told me that Rahmat Baba also had a daughter of your age who lived in Kabul. He didn't have the money to get her photographed or perhaps in those days there were no photographers in Kabul. So he had a print of her hand in a piece of paper and he used to keep it in his pocket near his heart. Just like Papa used to keep my photo in his wallet. Your father, I mean my great-grandfather, had given some money to Rahmat Baba so that he could go back to Kabul and see his daughter. But my papa never came back after that. You have told me that you had made the daughter of Rahmat Baba an unseen friend of yours. In your imagination, 
you would marry your boy doll with her girl doll. But when great grandmother heard it from you, she was angry. How could a Hindu doll be married to a Muslim one? <laughs> you were laughing when you told me that. My father's heart was very big. It could accommodate all Ishwar, Allah, Hindu and Muslims, he said fondly, remembering great grandfather. And when I performed the heart dissection for the first time in medical college, at once I started looking for Allah, for Ishwar, Hindus and Muslims. But there were only muscles and veins and arteries. Nowadays, when I receive wounded, bleeding patients, shouting with pain or breathing their last, I sometimes ask myself, had you not eaten those almonds and pistachios from Mehrnath Baba's bag 70 years ago? Had my great-grandfather not written his story, would I still be here in Kabul, in Kandahar, in Herat, in Helmut? Perhaps not. Most certainly not. Had you seen the city even once in your dream? You would have never let me come here. Here there are shadows of death on the walls of each house and lines of blood in each street and bazaar. Rahmat Baba left here ages ago. His daughter must have perished too. Here, devastation stalks everywhere. Each city of this country is in ruins. When I left home, you kissed my hands and told me, stitch all their wounds with these hands, but Dadima. Here I am, all exhausted, stitching the wounds, but the wounded still keep on coming. Dadima, I had a strange night. When night fell and we finished the day's work, I headed for my tent, totally exhausted, fell on my bed and immediately fell asleep. All of a sudden, some sound woke me up. It was dark in the tent. It seemed as if an animal is scratching the tent with its nails. Without thinking, I came out, bewildered. The greenish yellow moon of January on the dark sky, the sands of Dashte Laila on all sides, mass grave at some distance, and before my eyes, a young boy. Fresh, dry stains of blood on his shirt, fear and terror in his eyes, his whole body trembling. My first thought was calling a camp guard. Then Dadima, Something unexpected happened in a flash. The boy's face transformed. He took something out of his sack, lying near his feet, and extended it towards me. I looked at his hand. It was full of almonds, raisins, pistachios. He was calling you. Nervously, I looked at him. I swear by God that was Rahmat Baba in the light of January moon. Great grandfather had written that every January he was to go back to his home beyond the Hindu Kush mountains. Tears came to my eyes. How could I get him arrested? He was your childhood, my great grandfather's story. So I brought him to my tent. Nadima, that night, I witnessed death with my own eyes, touched it with my own hands. That night I learned that whether the bullet hits the ribcage of a friend or an enemy, I am destined to take it out. When dawn was about to break, I gave him some medicines and a fruit packet in a bag and a blanket and then signaled him to leave. Then I thought of something. I took some money from the purse lying on the bed and he shook his head, refusing. His eyes were full of tears. Then Dadima, I put the money in his hand and closed his fist around it. He took the same hand to his forehead and saluted me, threw his bag and blanket on his shoulder and went out of the tent. I kept on staring at his receding figure, a lone soul enveloped in fog and moon dust. After a few steps, he stopped and turned and looked towards me. Those were the eyes of a defeated tribe. Rahmat Kabuliwala was a fond memory of your childhood. But that night, it was pure pain that he gifted your kumpu. 
It's a good thing that great grandfather has passed away. Had he been living, he would have written about the wounds of the earth. In our village, there used to be fairs every year by the river. People from villages on the other side of the river used to come and participate. Few known, mostly unknown. So many unknown people used to stay at our house, but they never seemed unknown to me for long. They became part of our family very soon. I'll never forget the day when a circus crossed the river and came to perform in our village. I'll never forget the first time we went to see the circus. You and I sat between our parents, holding our cotton candy and fluorescent light sticks, laughing and laughing at the clowns and gaping at the bejeweled lady standing on top of the unicorn. Fireworks showered the sky. We clasped hands, jumping up and down and shrieking with delight. You used to come every winter. Since then, winters became so special for me with circus and paper boats. The waning moon would wait all night long on the river bank for the lonely flute. Every year, on a crimson dusk, the skies would melt as the cymbals played. The drums resounded. The bells muttered out from the mosque near the cart. Brown tents flared up through frenzied fumes of the temple dance. Caravans came, the banks lit up, elephants trolled, the trees turned red. Magic spells in the magic fair. Remember those magic days? Running through the fountains as our mothers strolled behind. Making puppet shows for the neighbors across the air shaft. Climbing up to kiss the noses of the stern marble lions that guarded the city buildings. Dancing through the fairs to soaring, lilting music. And then, at home, sleepy, building villages for imaginary creatures. In one quiet corner of the temple shore, you stood, my circus friend. Your eyes would roar. We waded through the waters, we ran through the breeze, we kissed the skies, we hung from the trees. My river flowed through our palms, held tight. We never knew it had another side. You had just moved to my city. From behind the curtain, behind the wall, I heard someone whisper behind us as we played. You were fashioning a small fence out of twigs. I don't think you heard that whisper. After all, you were just now learning the language. I loved the way you spoke. Side by side each day, without realizing it, my speech followed yours. Then, one day, you told me you were leaving. The river is no more a river. It's a border now. Your family was going back. Any kind of ferrying is stopped. Illegal now. I 
buried my face into my mother's skirt as she told me it would be very difficult to see you after you went back there, behind the curtain, behind the wall. The river bled through the folds of our palms. It trickled through our eyes. Behind the wall. It oozed through the roots of the people tree. Behind the iron curtain, my mother explained. On a wintry dawn, we had dug the depths of the pebbled bank to plant the magic tree. Behind the curtain. That is where he is now. Count my winters for your tree till its shadow the river sees, told my circus boy. Jabuna, Jabuna, go, Jabuna, je, Ruinu pore, Ghore ma je. I counted one. I pictured a curtain made of iron. Jabuna go, Jabuna je, Ruinu pore, Ghore ma je. I counted two. It looked like a wall. I counted three. Only impenetrable. I counted four. I couldn't sleep. I counted five. I couldn't swallow. I counted five. I moved the food around on my plate. I counted five. A lonely five. A strangled five. With a lump in my throat. A dreadful 1955. My father took me to the doctor. She won't eat, he said. The doctor examined me and found nothing. The doctor invited us into his office where we sat at his desk. What is the matter? the doctor asked. My numb words landed matter-of-factly. He is gone, I said. My friend is gone. And I looked out the window at the street a few blocks from where you and I had chased imaginary spirits around the square just a few weeks prior. I leaned my face against the office chair, murmuring into the leather. I may never see him again. I heard my river has been ripped into another side. I didn't dare picture the wall until the day it fell. The other side, from where the circus never came. Five years later at the airport, I waited for the plane to America. The other side where my horses remain. Look, said the flight attendant, who had been charged with escorting me between my own two lands. The other side where my moon still wanes. The wall. She pointed to the television as a crowd gathered. It was the wall. I looked up at the television and watched it crumble. Where my moon still wanes as the sound of a flute rains.
Uh, that was very, very touching and sensitive. And I was just wondering if you could share with us a little bit about the process and how you conceptualize this piece and then put it together. Oh, there's already somebody asking, Preeta, what inspired it? Similar kind of question. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to present this. Uh, so Rosalie and I have been working for many years now on making uh, cross-cultural performances, uh, mostly based on our own sharing of intimate relationships, experiences, stories. This piece, we've been working on this piece, I think, for the last one year, Rosie, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, we've been working on this piece uh, for the last one year. But uh, so we both have been writing about our own experiences of separation across borders, political and uh, religious. My piece is based on an intergenerational memory that belongs to my grandmother when she lived in East Pakistan. And she had this experience of a river uh, in her village that became a border, ultimately. And Rosie, Rosalie's experience uh, is from her own childhood when she uh, got separated from her childhood friend who had to move beyond the Berlin Wall. Uh, and over these years, uh, the impression that these experiences of separation that had left, uh, the impression that was there in our, in our minds, we started to write about it. And we realized that all of these experiences, though they speak of separation, loss, trauma, but in, at the heart of these experiences, there is also a kind of silent waiting, uh, waiting with, with endurance. And I think it is this, this moment of a sudden pause, these times that are so devastating, uh, that prompted us to find hope in waiting, to find some ways of artistically also to find a hope and beauty in waiting, in being able to endure pain. Uh, I remember that one night I had watched a flower, Night Queen, which, blo which blooms only once a year. And uh, I watched during isolation, I had watched this flower bloom over an entire night and it wilted right at the break of dawn. And I found a very deep sense of beauty in that waiting. And as the cliche, cliche goes, it reminded me of Tagore. And it reminded me of Tagore's, many of Tagore's works in which uh, he speaks of waiting, with endurance for the inner world to meet the outside world. Dag Khor, Rokta Korobi, Ochalayotun, Choturangu, many more, most of his works. Uh, there is a meeting of the inner world and the, and the outer world. And that kind of uh, led us to build this piece, this idea, this theme of waiting. So we had actually written the second part of the presentation before. And when we were putting it together, I suddenly remembered this one uh, letter, fictitious letter, which I had read, uh, written by Zahida Hina, who's an author based in Lahore. Uh, and in this letter, she writes, uh, in this letter, the five-year-old Mini from Tagore's Kabuliwala is now a 75-year-old grandmother and her daughter is writing to her from Kabul, which is a devastated city right now. And she has grown up listening about Kabul being a land of dreams, but she's there in Kabul and she's writing to her grandmother. Largely, we felt that this letter has deep resonances with the times that we are experiencing right now, also with the piece that uh, we both had written. Deep resonances in terms of forging human relationships and relationships of compassion in very, very difficult times. And we wanted to bring these pieces together, more so because they are from different cultures, from different historical timelines, from different contexts. Um, so that has majorly been, and we are, that has been the inspiration of our piece. But as after we had already written this, our artist collaborators added their own layers of consciousness to this piece. So it now belongs to eight people, uh, 
many, many of our collaborators are here in the panel. And I would briefly want to introduce uh, our collaborators. So Obhirupa, Obhirupa efficiently doubles in many art forms, that of a voice artist, of a radio presenter, management studies professor, and a mother. And uh, she says that, she, I'll, I'll, I'll read. She says that from telling stories to my children, to teaching communication to postgraduate management studies students, my art is my source of sustenance. Through my art, I have learned to see with my ears and hear with my eyes. So that is Obirupa. Ritojit has edited the film. Uh, Ritojit is a colorist. He is an editor. Uh, he lives in Mumbai and he leaves his heart in Kolkata. Uh, Ritojit has uh, an extremely holistic approach towards, towards art form, towards his, his own art because he takes interest in music. He's a musician. Uh, he has a deep interest in painting. So whenever he tells stories and in the form in which Ritojit tells stories, there are always overlaps between all the art forms and seamless overlaps. Um, Shomdatta is here. Shomdatta has a very responsible job in the administrative department with the government. So we know that she's extremely busy at this point, but she's also a singer and um, she lends her voice to largely to the, to the pain and stories of uh, communities, of many, many communities. And Shomdatta tirelessly works for uh, many communities in terms of you know, doing relief work and all other kinds of work. She, I think she finds her inspiration of art from there. Prathona has, uh, Prathona is a, Prathona is a visual artist. Prathona works primarily with printmaking and uh, with woodcut print in particular. And it is this uh, process oriented work that always attracts her. She has told this to me over and over again that how her hands are very important when she does her work. Uh, and so her works explore a very simple, which we already saw, a very simple and gentle relationship between uh, humans and nature and the desire for bonding and aspiration for freedom from a very feminine mind, from a very feminine experience inspires her work. Marianne has uh, also collaborated with us and I'm honored to have her with us as uh, to have her with us and that she has shared her artwork. I would probably at this point and James, James Dick, uh, David Jacobs has done the sound design of this piece. So I would uh, prob uh, at this point request Rosalie to talk a little bit about this uh, work. And if you could also talk about Marianne's and James' work since you're more familiar with the cultural context. Yes, we were joking that I would be responsible for my side of the ocean <laughs> when I introduce <laughs> designer in many genres from Western classical music to opera, international folk, rock, um, and all kinds of experimental music as well. Um, and he is also a very accomplished musician, in particular a cellist. And he has dedicated much of his expertise as music educator for uh, children, youth, adults, professionals, um, amateurs, and um, also as a radio host, and he currently is a classical music radio host for WETA in Washington, D.C. And um, Marianne Vandenberg is um, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, she's a painter, an installation artist, and a puppeteer. Uh, she divides her time currently between New York and Amsterdam, um, she attended the State Academy of Fine Arts in Amsterdam in the late 1960s. Um, and in the year 2000-ish, she went to Prague in the Czech Republic to study marionette making. Um, a lot of her work deals with, uh, the, and some of the work that you saw is from a series of pastel paintings um, called To the Grandparents I Never Knew because her own parents were uh, survivors of the Holocaust and the Holocaust and she wasn't able to ever meet her grandparents because they passed away. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't add one important, to me important detail about Marianne Vandenberg, which is that 
Uh, she is also my mother. <laughs> so she has also uh, had the great achievement of giving birth to me and seeing me to have safe passage through my youth and childhood and inspiring me still into adulthood. Um, so those are the two collaborators on my side that I can speak to. <laughs> Uh, Deborotti, would you like me to um, say anything more about the project? Yeah, if you if you want to say something about the work, about yeah, yeah, no, Deborotti covered. Um, you know, we we always are sort of like <laughs> two minds thinking alike. But I'll just add one detail that was uh, a way that Deborotti's work has really inspired me. Um, in this project in particular, because we began working together and with Chaipani. Um, in, was it 2017, I want to say, um, maybe even 2016. And the first project we did was a play about national borders. And a portion of Deborotti's written text that appeared in this work today um, was actually a monologue in that play as well. Like we had been working that out in that context of that play that we were writing. And I uh, was had the honor to <laughs> be able to act that monologue in the play. And in order to, you know, as an actor, connect with the experience of this particular border separation, internally, I was conjuring the memory of my very close friend from my uh, early childhood who had come to New York City, where I was living at the time, um, from Bulgaria, which was at the time, um, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, as they would call it. And our families became very close friends, but then at some point the family had to return and we were not able to see them for a long time because in those days, um, it was before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there was this, it was very difficult to travel back and forth. And I was remembering how um, heartbroken I was when I knew as a child that my friend had to return beyond what at that point, quite literally, I think as a child, I was imagining to be a literal iron curtain, you know, even though it was actually metaphorical. Um, and so I remember using that experience to connect myself to Deborotti's experience. And we had had conversations about this. So when it came time to work on this project, I um, kind of wrote from what I had been processing during the performing of that monologue as we were touring it. And that every time, you know, I would be remembering, you know, having time to process in that monologue, my own experience um, with my own childhood friend, who, by the way, now we've been reunited many times over and he actually lives in Berlin currently. And, and he, one of his many jobs is that he's a tour guide and he gives tours of the broken Berlin wall as one of the many things that he does nowadays. Um, yeah, and Deborah said more than I could ever uh, I mean, she spoke so eloquently about the piece. It's just been wonderful to work with her and on this project and with all of our collaborators. I was also wondering if uh, Ritojit or Obhirupa or any one of our collaborators, Shomdatta Prathona, would like to add something. So um, I'm a third generation refugee. My grandparents both on both sides hail from Bangladesh. And I grew up on the stories of Bangladesh. Uh, although I'm a city girl, a part of me always felt that there's a Desh somewhere, uh, which I would never be able to return to. Uh, I did return, though, about two years back. But then it was not the same, um, same space, same land. And till today, I carry that feeling of loss, an immense sense of loss and of, of rivers because Bangladesh is a country full of rivers and both my grandparents lived near the rivers and they had a very strong connection with rivers and fishes actually. Um, interestingly, I performed uh, as Mimi in Kabuliola uh, as a child a lot, lot more times, you know, wow. Bengalis used to have these um, para cultural programs during festivals. So um, it was for me, my experience of when I, each time when I read this letter is again, this letter that I read is part of uh, a Chai Pani production called Dear Earth, Hope You're Fine. And uh, that also uh, deals with the struggle of borders and separation. 
and each time i read this letter a letter written to mini as a grandma by a child who has who was raised with wonderful magical stories of kabul and uh, then the kabul that she sees and then the reconciliation what happens in the end uh, so that was my um, emotional contribution to the piece hello yeah so it's uh, i've been working with uh, devaruti opirupa rosali uh, for a long time so it wasn't pretty difficult for me to understand uh, the entire scenario of this presentation and they have already fed us with so many great art in this video that it, it was really um moving for me to do this i was really like uh, since since i was growing with the entire uh, video so it's like i got immersed in this entire scripting and just like obhirubadi said uh, right now that we have we have worked on a on on a on a presentation and on a uh project called dear earth hope you're keeping well so in in that play we used to do this structure and this was again like for this separation and for the displacement and everything so we were already in in this zone for a long long time like maybe from 2016 and 17 so yeah thank you so much devarthi for inviting me to do this job and yeah thank you thank you that was an absolutely fascinating session uh devaruti and rosalie thank you so much all your associates very very gripping session and uh, i'll just say bye to our listeners today those who logged on with a reminder that nobanno earth weekend new festival will be back for the second day in this third edition 2021 this this is the third edition and do please log on at 11 in the morning we have a packed schedule for you we hope you'll enjoy listening to all the sessions so we'll see you at 11 tomorrow thank you so much I, everyone thank you and i would just i would just jump in here to add something sure. very briefly uh, which is uh, rosalie i and all our collaborators we want to extend our heartfelt thanks to nobanno particularly also uh, because all our collaborators have uh, decided to offer a modest sum of honorarium to a students network across uh, west bengal who are doing uh, work for covid patients relief work for covid patients and this wouldn't have been possible without uh, nobanno extending this support to us and this is also uh, something which is very very special for us to be to be a part of this journey i just wanted to Thank say you. if rosalie had to add something we are hoping to um pro- move this project forward to make a fundraiser for the same for this particular student group um that we're going to launch on this side and without the opportunity to create this project with all of you for which we're so grateful um we might not have set that ball rolling so thank you all so so very much it's so uh, wonderful to have sat through and heard also the inspiration behind the whole thing and to watch this very sensitive piece Thank you very very much for being part of Nobanno Earth. I'm saying thanks to all of you, but thank you, Oindrila. Uh, you conducted this very efficiently, and it was a long hour. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>